Pacific Water Research Center. It's partnering with the Pacific Water Research Center uh, at Simon Fraser University, who's also our partner on this project. Um, for those that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Teresa Fresco, and I'm the program manager for Salmon Safe BC, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I'm joining you today alongside my colleagues, Christine Doiron and uh, Kelsey Taylor uh, from our homes in Vancouver, which is the unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I did want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the work that Indigenous people of these lands have done since time immemorial and continuing on today to protect and steward the lands, waters, and the salmon for future generations. So this webinar is the second of a three-part series uh, hosted by Salmon Safe BC called Salmon Safe Community Dialogues. We hosted our first webinar in September 2020 entitled Adjust Recovery for Urban Landscapes and we'll host our third webinar in February 2021. To access the recordings of our past webinars, I do encourage you to visit our Salmon Safe BC YouTube playlist, which can be found on the Fraser Basin Council YouTube page. Just a note that we are recording today's session uh, and we will be sending that to you all in the participant list um, but also we will be uploading it on our YouTube playlist in case you'd like to access it again. We also encourage you to like us on our Facebook and Twitter pages to stay up to date on all Salmon Safe news and events. Um, also, please stay tuned uh, until the end of today's webinar. We do have a special announcement related to Salmon Safe communications. And for those that are tweeting and Facebooking uh, during this event, we do have a hashtag set up. It's hashtag salmon cities so please do uh, use that hashtag so we can track what you're posting and also feel free to tag salmon safe bc and pacific water research center of course this webinar series wouldn't be possible without the support of our generous funders and supporters who we have listed here so wanted to give a, a big shout out and thank you for their generosity in supporting this important work before I introduce uh, our partners at Pacific Water Research Center, I did want to give a brief overview of the Salmon Safe BC program to set the stage for today's presentation. Salmon Safe BC is a program hosted by the Fraser Basin Council. We are a nonprofit, non government organization with a mission to advance sustainability in BC and a vision to um, have social well being supported by a vibrant economy and sustained by a healthy environment. Salmon Safe BC uh, actually started in the United States in 1997 as a program of Pacific Rivers Council in Oregon, and over the years grew into an independent nonprofit and leading eco label. Salmon Safe launched in BC in 2010 with our agriculture program and was followed by the urban program in 2013. In addition to Fraser Basin Council, you can see that Salmon Safe is now delivered by a, a, a wide array and network of partner organizations reaching as far south as California, all the way north to Washington State, and of course, on the side of the border here in BC. Our presentation today will focus on our urban development standards, but I did want to note that Salmon Safe does have a number of different certification programs and accreditation standards as part of the broader program. These include our agriculture and farm certification, parks and natural areas, urban campuses, and infrastructure, and our three firm accreditation programs for construction, developer, and designer firms. Salmon Safe is a standalone certification program, but I did want to note their complementarity with a number of different rating programs, uh, certification programs as well, including LEED, Envision, Living Building Challenge, Built Green, and Sustainable Sites. The strongest complementarity is with the LEED program. And just a note that if you were pursuing LEED for a building um, and you have your site Salmon Safe certified, you could get a bonus credit under the innovation and design category. So Andrea will be covering our urban standards in more detail, so I won't steal her thunder, but just to set the stage, um, there are five core standards uh, under the urban development standards that we have. And those are stormwater management, water use management, erosion prevention and sediment control, pesticide reduction and water quality protection, 
and enhancement of urban ecological function. If there is a water course that crosses through the site um, being considered, then uh, standards six and seven are triggered. Um, and those relate to in-stream habitat, riparian wetland vegetation, protection, and restoration. And also to give you uh, some foundation and context on the history of how the, the standards came to be, the urban standards were first developed in 2006 with an independent team of scientists that was led by the Northwest Watershed Institute, which is a nonprofit in Washington. The standards underwent routine updates, but they were significantly revised in 2016 to strengthen the urban ecological function focus. Um, this effort was led by Herrera Environmental Consulting, but also included significant input by BC experts that were convened by the Fraser Basin Council and Pacific Salmon Foundation. Um, and a note that another significant revision is currently underway with a focus on climate resilience. And so we are hoping to release that to the world in the coming months. So very excited for that. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Adil from Pacific Water Research Center to uh, give us an overview of their work and uh, introduce our presenter today. Thank you very much, Teresa. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really very nice to have you all join us this morning. My name is Zafar Adil. I'm the executive director for the Pacific Water Research Center. My day job is as the professor of professional practice in the School of Resources and Environmental Management at Simon Fraser University. So I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging that SFU operates on the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh people. And we are very uh, uh, privileged to be on these uh, unceded lands. I would also like to recognize that presently where I'm located in Maple Ridge is on the unceded territories of the Katsie and Kwikwetlam uh, First Nations. So again, it's a privilege to be on these lands and to be able to uh, avail all the natural resources here. Uh, so uh, what I would like to do is to give you a very brief introduction of the Pacific Water Research Center and talk about how this connects to uh, the, the work that we are about to hear uh, from Andrea. So uh, Pacific Water Research Center was set up uh, about five and a half years ago as a, uh, as a bridging institution, as a virtual center at Simon Fraser University to serve as a bridge between scientific endeavor and policy audiences. And, and we see this bridge working two ways, uh, uh, picking up existing knowledge and translating it into policy relevant formats, and also picking up exciting policy questions and undertaking research to respond to those questions. As you can probably imagine by the name of the center, we are focused on uh, challenging issues of water security and climate change and how it affects all of us. We are particularly interested in engaging communities in uh, finding solutions to these challenges. Uh, we see that uh, in, in order to achieve positive outcomes towards overcoming these challenges, policies are essentially the foundation stones on which uh, we, we build. And therefore, we have been quite interested in the, uh, in the policies, particularly around BC, on, that relate to water security, that relate to water quality, and that, uh, those that relate to uh, protecting ecosystems, particularly uh, salmon, uh, habitat. So we started a collaboration with uh, Fraser Basin Council, uh, I would say about four years ago, in discussing ways in which we might uh, collaborate and uh, un unpack some of these challenges and, and find uh, policy solutions. We, uh, at the beginning of last year, we started talking about uh, and looking at how Salmon Safe BC uh, standards are developed, how they interface with uh, with various um, rules and regulations and, and principles which are in place at the moment. Uh, that work uh, sort of builds the foundation for the research project that you're going to hear from uh, Andrea today. And the, the purpose of this research is to uh, really uh, sort of unpack how different policy frameworks compare to what's already in the, uh, in the Fraser Basin Council. Uh, sorry, in the Salmon Safe uh, standards. 
Uh, and obviously I will not delve into any details of that to uh, let Andrea give you a full picture. But I think from a policy perspective, it's, it's an important uh, milestone for us to be able to understand how these myriad policies interlink together and how we can uh, make maximum use of them to protect our ecosystems. So before I go on to uh, introduce Andrea, I would like to recognize the uh, funding and support we received from MyTax, uh, which supported her internship with uh, Fraser Basin Council. Uh, she was funded through the MyTax Accelerate uh, program. So we're very pleased that we were able to use the, uh, that resourcing. Uh, let me also take a minute to talk about a couple of uh, housekeeping items before I uh, introduce the floor and hand it to, uh, introduce Andrea and hand the floor to her. Uh, so please put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, which should be at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. It allows you to also upvote other people's questions, so you don't necessarily have to repeat it. Uh, you can put uh, comments in the chat section, but we will be focusing our attention on the Q&A box. I would encourage you, however, to put your introduction in the chat box, so we would really love to know more uh, about uh, your, you know, your own organizational affiliation and, and what your interest is. And uh, as you would have heard a, uh, an announcement at the beginning, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so uh, I, I presume that by staying in the meeting, you are uh, agreeing to be recorded. Uh, the hashtag for this meeting is Salmon Cities, as uh, uh, Teresa mentioned already. Uh, so those are just some housekeeping items. Uh, and when we go into the Q&A uh, block, we will take up your questions. And I think there's ample time allocated for that purpose. So it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Andrea McDonald. Uh, she is a second year Master's of Resource Management student at Simon Fraser University in the planning stream. She lives here in uh, Vancouver. Uh, she originally moved from Ontario, has uh, moved to uh, BC a few years ago to pursue her bachelor's in environmental science at University of British Columbia. Uh, where she participated in a field school program at Haida Gwaii, uh, focusing on natural resource management, conservation, and First Nation governance. So I think she had already a firsthand experience of uh, some of the, the issues that she's about to speak today. After her graduation, she worked uh, on environmental education and sustainable forest management program at UBC's Malcolm Knapp uh, Research Forest uh, here in BC. And after a few years of working in various environmental positions, uh, she was inspired to come back to school and we're very pleased that she did. Uh, uh, she's been working with me under my supervision. Uh, she uh, got enrolled in the uh, resource and environmental program uh, and, and she's uh, specializing in, in uh, the planning stream of that program. So uh, she's been quite uh, directly involved in the planning of the project that she's about to present. Uh, and uh, obviously she has a very keen interest in looking at how policies operate at different levels. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I'm obviously biased, but I think she's done a fantastic job of drilling through layers and layers of different policy frameworks and has uh, extracted some very useful and practical information. So without much further ado, let me hand over the floor to Andrea. So it's all yours, Andrew. Thanks, Adil. Let me just share my screen. Does that work for everybody? Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Adil and Teresa, for the wonderful introduction. So again, my project is creating safe cities for salmon. So I was looking to find um, any alignment between government policy and the salmon safe urban eco certification standards. So a brief overview of what my presentation is going to go through. Um, I'm going to start with a project overview, provide a regional context, discuss my research methods, and then go in a bit more detail about the salmon safe urban standards. Um, and then discuss the types of alignment I was looking for and found, and then go through the specific government policy analysis at each of the levels of government that I looked at. 
and then discuss the general trends and finish off with some concluding thoughts. So I'd like to thank Adil and Teresa and everybody at the FBC for providing me with this amazing opportunity. And I'd like to just spend a moment situating myself in my research here with a bit of background as to who I am as a researcher, especially where my motivations lie. And I myself am also located on the unceded and rightful lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And I'd like to recognize the historical and current intersectional harm and trauma that colonialism has caused for Indigenous communities and two-spirited individuals. And as a descendant from settlers myself, I believe that I've benefited from working and studying on these lands. And this is directly related to the great harm inflicted on Indigenous peoples. And I want this recognition to be connected with actions and commitments, as well as responsibilities to continually honor and respect their Indigenous rights, cultures, and ways of being. And it's also about figuring out ways that I can use my experience, training, and knowledge to uplift and support Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination through my actions, as well as my research. So the project was mainly motivated to find alignment with the government policy um, standards and design guidelines and all the various levels of policy um, and promote SAM and SAFE to be more integrated within the region. Um, also assessing the strength of current policy in comparison to the SAM and SAFE standards as they are directly derived for the biological needs of salmon and have been peer reviewed. So they're very scientifically strict um, and just using that as a comparison framework um, for the design criteria for development in uh, the lower Fraser Valley. So um, there are many stressors impacting our watersheds and urban development plays a very significant role in that. So according to research that was done and published in the Broad Inlet Action Plan, um, there are 320 stormwater outfalls which release untreated urban runoff directly into the Broad Inlet in addition to the 35 provincially authorized industrial waste discharges. Now the 320 stormwater outfalls are collecting runoff from the 20% of the region that's covered by impervious surfaces. So this means that the water cannot infiltrate into the ground. And research has shown that impervious surface cover within a catchment of greater than 10 to 20% has been directly linked to degraded water quality in nearby water courses and water bodies, which is directly impacting, impacting our salmonid species as well. So 2019 was a record-breaking year for sockeye salmon in the Fraser River, and that was not in a good way. And again, this year, we saw the drop in forecasted numbers from over 900,000 to less than a third of that. So with challenges like the landslide at Big Bar, the ever-increasing water temperatures from anthropogenically accelerated climate change, um, and development that is occurring in our urbanized watersheds, these local salmon populations are experiencing major stressors, many of which are human-induced. Now to add that additional layer of stress from the degraded water quality due to wastewater discharge and high volumes of urban runoff, these impervious areas are only anticipated to grow with growing population and urbanization in the region. And non-point source pollution has been shown to have many harmful effects on local waterways and the salmonid species that inhabit them, often referred to as a juvenile mortality syndrome. So as the Lower Fraser watershed will begin to experience warmer and wetter winters, finding ways that can mitigate human caused stressors on our local waterways to help salmon is absolutely necessary. So some research done at the UBC Martin Labs, um, at the UBC Martin Lab by Riley Finn um, has built on the extensive work provided by uh, Sharon Proctor. And it outlined the sheer magnitude of habitat loss that our local salmon populations have experienced. And according to their work in Vancouver alone, roughly 120 kilometers of salmon streams were eliminated during development over the decades. And with roughly 117 streams in total being lost in the Fraser Valley since the start of their records. And many of these streams and creeks were converted into ditching systems while some were completely buried altogether. And one of the major challenges we face now is understanding the degree of impact that we've had, where we want to restore it back to and how are we going to get there. So some background on my research questions, I was answering primarily what policies, legislation, regulation within indigenous, federal, provincial, and local governments align with the objectives and standards of the Salmon Safe BC Urban Program. And then what was the nature of that alignment and to what degree did it align? 
And then how can Salmon Safe adapt their core urban standards to better align and operate more effectively under these existing policy frameworks, in addition to what kind of policy recommendations to the various governmental agencies could be made to promote the implementation of the Salmon Safe Urban Program and strengthen their uh, design standards and development standards as well. So a little bit about the methods and process that I've taken to get to where I am today. So starting back in February, I began a literature review that was looking at urban stormwater, green infrastructure, and kind of critique and summary of government policy that exists within British Columbia and Canada in general. And then I started my provincial analysis, which looked at the Water Sustainability Act, the Repairing Areas Protection Act and Regulations, the Environmental Management Act, and then any sort of best management practices, documents that were released and um, provided by the province as well. And the federal analysis started about mid spring, looking at the Fisheries Act, the Wild Salmon Policy, the Species at Risk Act, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, and then again, any sort of best management practices documents or guidelines that were released by the federal government, usually from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And then I moved on to my indigenous analysis, which looked at the land use plans, comprehensive community plans and action plans for the Squamish Nation, Musqueam and the Slave Tooth Nation as well. And then I moved on to the largest portion, which was looking at the local analysis. And I looked through all of the bylaws, the official community plans, um, any action plans, the integrated stormwater management plans, as well as any sort of best management practices documents, which is primarily in the form of design criteria and guidelines or erosion sediment control guidelines, those sorts of things. For Metro Vancouver, Vancouver, Burnaby, North Vancouver, the District of North Van, um, Surrey, and Delta, in Delta as well, pardon me. And then I moved on to the interview process and the interviews I conducted um, at a federal level, at the provincial level with a member of the liquid waste management team, at a regional level with Metro Vancouver. And then I conducted an interview with each municipality that I looked at, except for the city of Burnaby, which I was not able to um, arrange an interview with. And that also applies for, and I'll expand on this in a second, for the indigenous governments as well. So I wasn't able to um, set up an interview with anyone from the First Nations. So I also had interviews, however, with external experts. So people that were not that work in partnership and collaboration with local governments and various levels of government, but themselves are not necessarily working within the government to provide that outer context. Um, and then I synthesized all of this. So I put all these documents into a referencing software and annotated all the alignment. And then I put that into Invivo, which is a qualitative um, analysis software. And I coded those to see of what the alignment I did find, what portion of it aligned with each of the different standards and to what degree. And then I worked to identify any trends that I found across municipalities as well as throughout the region. And then finalization step, which is kind of what's happening right now is this presentation. And then hopefully I'll receive some feedback and incorporate that into my final report to give to the FBC in the new year. So the types of alignment um, is important for me to cover. So I was looking at what kind of alignment, so what standards did it specifically align with, and then to what degree, was it high, medium, or low alignment? And this alignment could be with the objectives of Salmon Safe, so they shared similar objectives with the different sorts of standards, or it could be directly aligning with the actual standards and the performance requirements for that standard within the Salmon Safe program to get certified. So for the Salmon Safe standard to provide a bit of context as to what each of these mean. So the first five are the core standards. And like Teresa said, the last two are the context specific standards. So the first standard um, aims to minimize the amount of stormwater generated on site and then improve the quality of that stormwater runoff um, where possible. The second standard um, is to reduce water withdrawals and the use of potable water altogether and promote the use of rainwater as well as any gray water reuse on site. The third standard um, is promoting effective erosion control, design and maintenance practices that can prevent erosion um, and capture the sediment before it actually leaves the site. 
the fourth standard, um, the principal method is to avoid contamination of the salmon bearing waters um, and minimize the overall input of those contaminants and restrict what those contaminants could actually be, um, which can be done in the form of an integrated pest management plan. And then uh, the fifth core standard is to promote a broader non-aquatic ecological function, which could be important for urban wildlife, such as birds, bats, and pollinators as well. And then the last two context specific standards. So these are for developments that are um, occurring near or within, uh, not on, but <laughs> in proximity to a uh, water body. So um, the sixth standard is assessing the condition of the actual channel or the water body, including the stream bed and its bank um, and identifying opportunities to restore and improve that. And the same goes for the seventh standard which takes measures to protect those areas closest to the surface water bodies, um, which is their riparian vegetated zone and uh, wetland areas as well. So I categorize the alignment into three levels. So low, medium and high. And um, as I had said previously, of the seven standards, within the standards themselves, they have various different performance requirements that are necessary. So they can get very specific like things like harvesting rainwater where possible or ensuring that the building material doesn't put wildlife at risk. So using bird friendly design guidelines and all those sorts of urban friendly um, wildlife design. So those are the more performance requirements which are pretty specific. Um, so if I identified low alignment, it would be something like preserving vegetation on site. So it has a similar objective, but it not necessarily is very prescriptive. Um, medium <clears throat> is similar to the objectives and standards, but might not be as strict or prescriptive as the same safe standards are. And then the high alignment <clears throat> shares very similar standards with the performance requirements of SAM and SAFE as well, or the direct um, objectives if it's a more overarching document. So to get into the actual policy analysis, <clears throat> I'm gonna go through each level of government and starting with the indigenous governments, then go into the federal, provincial, and then um, our local governments as well. So starting with the indigenous governments, I just wanna make it very clear that this was just a paper exercise. So I was only looking at documents that were available online through council websites and any sort of external partnership websites that talked about the programs um, conducted by the First Nations. And there was no interviews. Um, I wasn't able to uh, arrange an interview with any of the First Nations. So keeping that all in mind and also noting that a lot of this information may not be and probably is not in document form and is held within the community itself by the knowledge holders. And as an outsider, I may not necessarily have access to that information. So I hope that in future, someone can dedicate more time to this actual alignment to figure out better ways to approach this um, aspect of the project as well to identify alignment more properly and appropriately. So this quote is from waterbucket.ca. And I think this quote by Morgan Blacksock stating that water is the lifeblood of Musqueam outlines how me reading through their policies online and government documents won't really provide a proper and appropriate understanding of the alignment with salmon safe necessarily. Um, but this quote kind of provides that interconnectedness theme that is permeating throughout all of the documents that I did find and have access to online. So I think that is really important to set the stage for the rest of the documents I'm gonna talk about. So as I said, I looked at the Musqueam, uh, Slaywood-Tooth and Squamish nations. And within each of those, I these were the documents that I had been working with. And just to provide a bit of context for what each of these documents entails. So for the Musqueam nation, I looked at the comprehensive community plan. So this is community planning for the actual community. And then it's similar for the Musqueam land use plan. So you can see it says IR2, three and four. So this is for, on reserve lands for the Musqueam and on reserve activities. Um, whereas in comparison to the Slaywood Tooth Nation, these documents had a different spatial and temporal scale, looking at the Bright Inland Action Plan and the Land Use Plan, which was for 100 years and also covered all of the traditional territories as well. So the scope was a lot more broad. Um, and then the Squamish Nation, I looked at their strategic vision. 
um, which just kind of sets direction for the community more broadly. Um, and I also looked at their bylaws. So that was for on reserve enforcement. And these documents and plans, as I said, really vary across different spatial and temporal scales. So keeping that in mind as I go through and discuss the alignment. So starting with the comprehensive community plan, there are two actions within the plan that had um, medium alignment, especially with the fifth standard, which is um, a very common form of alignment throughout most of the documents as it promotes things like habitat connectivity, um, combating invasive species and promoting native flora and fauna as well. So and protecting and restoring those natural and sensitive ecosystems, which is really important. And this is also translated into their land use plan as well. So again, this is just for on reserve lands and the highest alignment was the last three standards of um, salmon safe. So the context specific standards, as well as the uh, enhancement of urban ecological function and some alignment with stormwater management. So development permits were required and are required for any removal of trees, native vegetation, or the installation of any impervious paving or the alteration of any drainage patterns within 91 meters of a riparian area. So this document really promotes environmental protection as well as water conservation, which is why the alignment is shown at the bottom of the screen as it is, where the lighter colors are medium alignment and the darker colors, once again, are higher alignment. So moving on to the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, starting with the Burrard Inlet Action Plan, which is an extremely extensive document um, and very comprehensive. Uh, I looked at identifying mainly things related to um, ecological restoration and stormwater management. So they did have specific goals in this document to reduce um, contamination and improve water quality within the inlet, and as well as any sort of contamination that's coming into the inlet in the form of stormwater runoff. So also during this past semester, I was working with the TWN to try and identify different best management practices that could be used for um, on-site stormwater management. So efforts are definitely being made um, within the TWN to characterize non-point source pollution and find ways to mitigate it both on and off reserve. Um, and specifically, one of their actual goals was to develop an industry specific eco certification program to encourage the adoption of best management practices for reducing non point source pollution. So very, very similar to what is in, uh, what comes with the salmon safety eco certification. As for their land use plan, um, it worked to limit uh, development and preserve sensitive ecosystems as well as preserving or enhancing water quality and implementing a storm stewardship program to protect the waterways from pollutants and contaminants, um, which is seen in the stormwater alignment as well as the last two standards too. And then the enhancement of the ecological function, the fifth standard really came through in the emphasis on providing wildlife corridors and protecting and enhancing fish habitat, as well as maintaining creek flow through developing areas to make sure that future development doesn't negatively impact water quality or the quantity that flows through the site. And lastly, for the Squamish Nation, um, last but not least, of course, I looked at their strategic vision for the next three years. Um, and of course, this was a very small review as there's only two aligning documents that I could have access to online. So the strategic vision did, however, provide a more general overview for the um, direction of the community to have marine use policies and environmental management plans to protect their lands. And as well as the pr preservation and protection and management of fish bylaw, which was very similar to what's found in the uh, Fisheries Act in terms of prohibiting um, any blockage or alteration of a water course and prohibiting any discharge of any deleterious substances into the water course itself. So again, the alignment is primarily um, with preserving those sense of ecosystems as well as stream and riparian areas once again. So moving on to the federal and provincial level review, um, I'm gonna start with the federal review and provide just a general overview <clears throat> and then go into the provincial level. And again, this could be an entire presentation on its own. So this is just a very brief overview. So starting with the Fisheries Act, 
the lighter colors for Sarah and SIPA, those are both documents that were in lower alignment with Sam and Safe, whereas the medium colored green, um, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but the medium colored green, these documents were in medium alignment, whereas the uh, darker green, again, that was a very high aligning document. So the Fisheries Act and regulations to start with that, again, is very well known for prohibiting deleterious substances, the protection of fish and fish habitat, which means no altering or blocking of the fish passage. Um, and the Fisheries Act in principle applies to only waters that contain fish when we're talking about water quality, and it could be containing fish, contain fish, or has the potential to contain fish. Um, and it also does not explicitly provide any standards for water quality targets, especially for run rainwater runoff or non-industrial discharge. So it, its alignment was relatively just in the form of protection of fish habitat, um, as well as those water bodies themselves. So unfortunately, there are very few places actually within the municipalities I looked at, this is not necessarily the case, but within urbanized landscapes, as I stated earlier, we've lost a lot of those salmon bearing streams. Um, but when there is development occurring near one of these, it does need to um, take into account the Fisheries Act and its regulations, of course. So moving on to the wild salmon policy, um, this introduced the concept of conservation units. So this calls for special attention to the various populations to ensure prote uh, the protection of the genetic diversity within the populations. So although there's no regulations attached to this policy, it does provide a stronger push um, for the federal government towards sustainable management of these salmon populations. Um, and al alignment with salmon safe was purely in the form of objectives as it shares uh, similar objectives for protecting salmon and salmon habitat, of course. For the last two on the screen that were acts in legislation for SARA and SEPA, which again is a Species at Risk Act and the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. These were both low, but they weren't irrelevant because some of the Fraser salmon populations or populations within the area are at risk. So SARA can apply, as well as the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. It does provide protection requirements for the environment. And it does have mention of non-point source pollution, but doesn't provide any specific uh, regulations and standards attached to that. Um, and then the last documents through the dotted arrow to the land development guidelines. So this is a heavily cited document that many municipalities use, and it provides guidance for the safe construction near a water course, erosion and sediment control, runoff control, as well as safe in-stream works and limiting any sort of contamination or deleterious substances being discharged into those water bodies. So the alignment with Salmon Safe um, we have on the side of the screen. So it's higher with the context specific standards. And this does not include the alignment with the land development guidelines, which has very high alignment with almost all of the different standards um, for Salmon Safe because it provides very prescriptive step-by-step uh, -step process for developing um, in protecting aquatic habitat. So it does have much more relevance than is shown on the screen here. Okay, so moving on to the provincial government, I'm gonna have a couple slides that expand on this a little bit. So the Environmental Management Act, starting with that, again, the lighter green, so it's a, a medium alignment. It did provide um, the mandate for integrated liquid waste and resource management plans. So this was created by Metro Vancouver for member municipalities to adopt and required by 2016 that integrated stormwater management plans were to be cre created for each municipality in order to adhere to those provincial requirements. So that is where the ISMPs kind of come in. And then in terms of riparian areas regulation and any sort of stream protection, um, the Riparian Areas Protection Act um, enforces a setback of 30 meters to provide standards, it's 30 meters, but it can also range depending on the classification of the stream, provide standards to operate within the riparian area to ensure the protection of um, the riparian area from development, pollution, and erosion and sediment. So I'll expand on that as well in just a moment, but the Water Sustainability Act had medium alignment, which I'm going to talk about, but before I do, I wanted to mention the dotted arrow to the stormwater planning and then the beyond the guidebook series. So 
this had very, very high alignment with the standards of salmon safe. Um, and I'm going to expand on how the alignment at the bottom of the screen comes from these documents for stormwater management, erosion prevention and sediment control, as well as the context specific standards for in stream and riparian area protection. So for the Water Sustainability Act, it was a transformative act that was enacted in 2016, and it introduced regulations for groundwater, but it also introduced a more holistic concept to water management through watershed planning and sustainability plans. So local governments are encouraged in the Water Sustainability Act to utilize uh, the water objectives in their official community plans. Um, in addition, any development that impacts sensitive streams that are classified as sensitive streams within the WSA must adhere to the regulations put in place by the water sustainability regulations. So through the interview process, um, as well as through my own research, although it was introduced in 2016, it still has quite a ways to go in terms of its implementation on the ground and how that could be translated into an urban watershed context. So it's gonna be a matter of time to see what the regulations that slowly come out um, are gonna look like. So for right now, it does have lots of potential and it'll be interesting to see it develop into the future. So um, to start, this graphic was from the Water Sustainability Action Plan for BC and was provided by Kim Stevens, who I think is here today. And it outlines the evolution of the stormwater planning, which is the on the right side of the screen, a guidebook to um, stormwater planning in British Columbia. And it eventually evolved into the Beyond the Guidebook. Sorry. <laughs> um, it introduced a shift from stormwater management to rainwater management. So it looks at rainwater not just as a resource, but as something that requires management beyond those storm events, because it's raining a lot here. So it needs to not just be for peak flow events, but all rainfall. And then the guidebook also clearly outlines ways for local governments to implement their required integrated stormwater management plans as well. And the Beyond the Guidebook series has provided quite a lot of guidance for local governments on how to, again, implement those rainwater management plans and promote the transition from stream protection to stream restoration, which is in very high alignment with what Salmon Safe also requires. So the emphasis being put on just because it may be a degraded natural asset does not mean that it doesn't have the potential to provide those ecosystem services. So efforts should be put into restoring these ecosystems um, as well as protecting them as well. So uh, finally finishing off with the Riparian Areas Protection Act. This is a little flow chart to show how a developer would follow the riparian areas regulations. So it requires um, a 30 meter setback, but can vary depending on the classification of the stream. So it is in high alignment with the requirements for the last two context specific standards. But again, uh, Salmon Safe is much stricter um, as it limits the impacts within 60 meters of a stream um, in a riparian area. So uh, this is important to set context for the stream protection and enhancement area bylaws that I'm gonna discuss for the local governments. So once I get to that, um, you'll see that as the local, as the developer comes to local government, if they have that stream protection enhancement area bylaw or bylaw that meets or exceeds the RAR, then they would adhere to the bylaw. Otherwise, it goes through the riparian areas protection regulation um, process eventually to be approved. So finally, moving on to our local level, I'm going to start with Metro Vancouver as a regional context and then go into the six municipalities that I looked at, finish off with the interviews, and then some of, again, some of the general trends. So for Metro Vancouver, I'm gonna look at the regional growth strategy, as well as the very important integrated liquid waste and resource management plan, as it is one of the more high, align, high aligning documents with uh, Salmon Safe. So Metro Vancouver 2040, which is shaping our future, I know is currently in the process of being uh, updated at this time, um, but it did provide quite a bit of alignment. So this is a sunburst diagram that came from the coding of the different uh, alignment areas. So within the document, I coded all of the different alignment with each of the different standards. So of all of the alignment, how much of the alignment is with standard five, how much of it was with standard six, and how much of it was standard seven. So you can see 
the different areas and how the percentage of it is primarily in the form of enhancement of ecological function. So there is a lot of emphasis on habitat connectivity, um, restoration and protection, as well as mitigating any invasive species in the area. Um, and then standard six was focusing on um, to limit impacts on stream habitats as well. And then that kind of translates into this, the seventh standard, which was in alignment with a lot of the different policies within the regional growth strategy to protect and restore wetlands and riparian areas as well. This document did also have mention of stormwater management um, required in the region and uh, water use conservation methods that could be applied as well to reduce the use of potable water across Metro Vancouver. So this is the integrated liquid waste and resource management plan for the Greater Vancouver Sewage Drainage District and member municipalities. So this was adopted by Metro Vancouver to help those municipal member municipalities adhere to the requirements of that Environmental Management Act, which requires the liquid waste management plans to demonstrate how the region will be managing liquid waste in the form of both rainwater and municipal waste discharge as well. So it had high alignment with the first two standards as it really promoted water conservation um, on site as well as water reuse where possible, um, rainwater harvesting as well, uh, as well as on site stormwater management. Pesticide reduction was also included in this document as well as uh, enforcing stormwater plans as well, which is quite obvious considering this led into the ISMPs. So, these are the documents provided by Metro Vancouver, which really help member municipalities meet those requirements. So starting on the left of the screen with the region-wide baseline for on-site stormwater management, this baseline is a guideline for updating municipal bylaws to require the on-site stormwater management that either meets the regional baseline um, or that that's been established within the integrated stormwater management plans. So, to do that, they can also utilize the stormwater source control design guidelines. And this is a great best management practices document um, to help municipalities meet the requirements of the integrated liquid waste management plan. And then finally finishing off in the middle with the monitoring and adaptive management framework, the AMF um, would be adopted by member municipalities as a guide to monitor watershed health and assess, like assess the effectiveness of their ISMP. So in order to meet those provincial requirements. So the AMF itself <clears throat> had high alignment because it promotes habitat restoration, pollution reduction, erosion control, as well as riparian and stream protection. So there was quite a bit of alignment um, with the salmon safe standards. So, Transitioning from Man Metro Vancouver into our municipalities, I included six municipalities and would have loved to have done all of them, but that, I think that would have taken a PhD to do that. So um, these were chosen based on two factors. So the first was I used this original scoping review that was done for the FBC prior, which looked at alignment with the urban standards and categorize the municipalities into high, medium, or low. So very similar to what I've done. Um, so I use that as a guiding document to start. So I looked just at the high alignment municipalities. And then once I began, I got in contact with a few people who were really championed for some municipalities to be included in this because they were really great case studies to include, especially for stormwater management. Um, which is why these six municipalities were chosen. And if I did have more time, I was told that Coquitlam and Port Moody, New West and the Township of Langley also would have really been great case studies to examine as well. So before diving into all of the local government policy, I also just wanna point out the difference in scale, which I think is pretty obvious because a lot of people are probably from the region, but the city of Vancouver in comparison to the Corporation of Delta, the population is very different as well as the, but the size being larger. So taking, in that, taking that into account for the size of the government is really important with all the bylaws, action plans and all those sorts of things that come with it. So the size definitely did influence the amount of documents that I was able to look at. So starting with an overview of the entire region. So they, these pie charts again, are the same sort of coding analysis that I had provided for the regional growth strategy. 
So what this map is outlining is the alignment um, of the official community plans specifically with the um, various salmon safe standards, which are outlined in the legend on the right of the screen. So the, C, the city of Vancouver could not be included properly in this because they fall under the Vancouver charter. So they don't have a official community plan per se. So the comparison wouldn't have been um, appropriate. I don't think they have a very aligning document that's exactly like an OCP. So I didn't want to include it and misrepresent it in any way. So this is just for the other five municipalities. And where there is alignment, you can see that a significant portion of alignment throughout the region was in the form of stormwater management, meaning that the OCPs did have lots of mention of policies and objectives that aligned with the requirements within Salmon Safe for stormwater management objectives. And the other large aligning area was in the form of um, standard number five, which is the enhancement of ecological function. So this was also really prominent throughout the OCPs with a really common theme of restoration and habitat connectivity throughout each municipality. So that's gonna shine through once again. And the last is the yellow wedge, which is the pesticide reduction in water quality was quite large in some municipalities. Um, and very common uh, was the ban of pesticides for cosmetic use. So that was pretty common across all of the municipalities I looked at as well. So starting specifically with the city of Vancouver, I'm gonna go over the zoning bylaw, talk about the rainwater management bulletin, as well as the rain city strategy. So starting with the zoning bylaw, um, in the zoning bylaw, it states that developers are to retain and treat the first 24 millimeters of rainwater within a 24 hour period and from all areas and remove 80% of the total suspended solids by mass. So this is the objective is to limit the peak flow rate discharge so that post-development flow is equal to pre-development flow. So there's no net increase in runoff from the development site. So moving on to the far right of the screen for the rainwater management bulletin, which had alignment with the first three standards, primarily alignment with the first standard, the rainwater management bulletin, which I also included the rezoning for sustainable large developments target as well in this. Um, and this applies for all private developments in addition to all rezoning citywide developments of townhouses and more de dense developments within the candy corridor. So the target is 24 millimeters of capture and 48 millimeters of cleaning. However, the council I've been told has uh, adopted to make both of those requirements 48 millimeters for the private sector by 2022. And then lastly, the rain city strategy. Um, within the rain city strategy, the design targets are applicable for impervious surfaces within the city for all streets, public spaces, parks um, in order to capture, retain, and treat the first 48 millimeters of rain per day. So there was definitely high alignment with the first two standards as well. Um, this is the ISMP for the city of Vancouver or the IRMP rather, because it's an integrated rainwater management plan. And this document um, was very holistic and comprehensive as it didn't just take uh, a stormwater management approach, but rather did take all angles. And I thought it was a very digestible document um, for even a lay person to read through. So it was very accessible, um, I think for people within the city of Vancouver to read themselves. So I think that was really interesting to read through the Rain City strategy. So um, I've created matrix like matrices for each of the different municipalities, which I'll finish off with each of the case studies for them. And across the top, I've tried to create it so that across each line, it carries through with the different documents. Um, so you can see where the document hit the target and where it didn't necessarily align with. So the Rain City strategy did have high alignment with um, enhancement of ecological function, as well as of course with rainwater management. Um, being the first standard, and it did have alignment with the last two standards ever so slightly, but of course it's very, very different because the city of Vancouver doesn't necessarily have many daylight streams, but there was effort within it to discuss the daylighting of streams when possible. Um, and then you can see as well the waterwise guidelines in combination with the bird friendly design guidelines did provide a lot of what, a lot of what Salmon Safe is actually providing as well. 
um, as well as the erosion and sediment control bulletin and the rezoning for large sustainable developments. All of these did provide and fill in the gaps that maybe the rain city strategy didn't provide necessarily. And the biodiversity strategy also was in quite high alignment with the last three standards, which is down here at the bottom. Yeah. So moving on to the North Shore, to the city of North Vancouver, I looked at the bylaws and development guidelines. I actually looked at much more than this, but I just wanted to include just this today. Otherwise the presentation would have been much too long. So um, the city of North Vancouver, I looked at the subdivision and development control bylaw. So this required that alternative stormwater management be required on site um, with any overflow being put into the municipal drainage system. So it also promoted the native planting and drought resistant landscaping on site and um, may require stormwater management plans. So the other bylaw that had alignment was the stream drainage system protection bylaw. And this um, prohibit, prohibited the fouling of streams, promoted an open stream policy, required sediment control plans, and again, just prohibited any pollution or contamination um, or contaminated discharge rather going into any streams. So protected those streams and drainage systems. Um, and then the last relevant document was the stream protection and enhancement guidelines. So this is, I think, in compliance with the RAR. So it offers very similar requirements from 15 meters from the top of a bank. So any development occurring within that area. Its overall goals are to protect the riparian area, of course, while limiting impervious surfaces, controlling erosion, and enhancing habitat all in order to protect the stream and the riparian area in general. So there was quite a bit of alignment with these documents. So as you can see across the top, there was quite a bit of alignment um, with the official community plan, especially for the last three standards. Um, again, this usually comes in the form of habitat connectivity, stream protection, riparian protection, um, as well as stormwater management for the first standard um, for the official community plan. As well, the ISMP did uh, as well provide those standards and the stream and drainage systems protection bylaw also provided erosion sediment control um, measures that are necessary. So there was a policy or a guideline or a bylaw that was required to within each of these different sorts of uh, salmon safe standards. So it was hit across all of the different targets. So moving a little bit north of the city of North Vancouver is the district of North Vancouver. And I looked at the development permit areas as well as the bylaws. So for starting with the development servicing bylaw, this had a lot of alignment with Salmon Safe. So you can see uh, with standard one, three, four, five, six, and seven. So the goal for stormwater management within this bylaw is that land drainage designs that promote and replicate natural water balance was considered to be best management practices by the district um, and required a minimum riparian setback of 30 meters um, efforts to restore those water courses. And it has to, any sorts of plans or development has to incorporate erosion and sediment control, stormwater management, as well as water quality control and habitat enhancement for these areas. So a very similar trend to some of the other um, bylaws from the other municipalities that I looked at. Then there was the environmental protection and preservation bylaw, and this prescribed those land development guidelines. So this is the first mention of the land development guidelines. The city of North Vancouver also mentioned the land development guidelines, I think for some water quality metrics. Um, so it's also mentioned again with the district of North Vancouver. And it this bylaw in the middle for environmental protection does exactly what it says. So it also protects streams and wetlands and prohibits any fouling of those water courses. And the last on the far right is the development permit area. So these, this is kind of a trend for all of the DPAs that are related to streamside, as well as protection of natural environment. So these are required once again for works within 15 meters of the water course where no development should be occurring. They also, the, the reason I bring this up is because there was a unique habitat compensation measure, which required the replacement of each tree with three trees. So that was explicitly stated in the development permit area guidelines, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, overall, the objective is to minimize 
impacts on wildlife um, as well as the riparian area and the corridors within it. So overall, you can see the alignment, oops, my bad. Okay, so you can see the alignment across the screen, especially for the top, the official community plan had quite a bit of alignment with all of the salmon safe standards, um, a little bit less with the water use conservation and the erosion and sediment control, but that was then provided by the development and servicing bylaw and the streamside protection DPA, as well as their erosion and sediment control measures. So they did have, the DPAs did carry through quite a bit with the last three standards, um, as well as providing erosion and sediment control. So you can see how their bylaws did carry through across most of the urban standards. Now, um, moving on to the city of Burnaby, looking at the bylaws and best management practices. So the city of Burnaby has the watercourse bylaw, and this requires sediment and erosion control plans and measures. Um, and it also, once again, prohibits any discharging or fouling of contamination into waterways. So this is very common for all of the watercourse bylaws that I read through. Then they had the zoning bylaw, which included the stream protection and enhancement area. So again, this ranged in this bylaw from five to 30 meters, depending on the stream classification. Um, and then the last on the far right was the de design criteria manual. So this was, um, this outlined all construction needing to have erosion and sediment control, as well as adhering to what was required in the integrated stormwater management plan the official community plan, or even the neighborhood concept plan. So it had to be a very holistic integration of all of those different requirements. Um, and then also in addition, I was told that the now every town center also has the requirement of on-site stormwater management to be implemented on site. So that was uh, a new addition as well. And the city also implements those land and development guidelines once again, as metrics for water quality measure for development um, for protecting aquatic ecosystems. And this can be seen um, across the top, the OCP didn't necessarily have much alignment with the second and third standard, but did have alignment, especially a big emphasis within the OCP for protecting habitat connectivity and sensitive ecosystems, as well as their environmentally sensitive areas strategy itself and the plan for green, uh, Burnaby's Green Future was both really comprehensive documents that had almost alignment with all of the different targets, uh, all the different standards as well. Um, as well, they also had a pesticide use control bylaw that prohibited the use of pesticides, um, some pesticides on properties for landscaping as well. So the second to last um, municipality that I looked at was the city of Surrey, looking at the bylaws and development permit areas. I'm gonna outline here. I did read through, as I outlined at the very beginning, all those other documents. And the city of Surrey does have quite a lot of ISMPs, which I'll talk about at the end, which took most of the time reading, but the stormwater drainage regulations and charges bylaw, um, required that all new parcels had to be constructed with on-site stormwater management facilities. And those had to adhere to, once again, what was required in the integrated stormwater management plan for that area, the neighborhood concept plan or the master drainage plan as well. So that was a unique mention within this Sur within Surrey's bylaw. So I didn't see that necessarily in any of the other bylaws. Um, and it, again, protects those waterways and streams and creeks from any sort of blockage or obstruction or fouling once again. So as for the other bylaws, <laughs> this looks very big, but the alignment was for stormwater management, erosion prevention and sediment control, and the last two standards again. So these bylaws, there is very specific bylaws for the pesticide use control bylaw, as well as the erosion and sediment control bylaw. Um, those had very explicit measures that need to be taken. Um, to control those. And then uh, as well, there were measures for in-stream habitat protection and restoration through the other bylaws as well. And then on the far right, the biodiversity conservation strategy um, had high alignment with the last three standards once again to protect any critical habitat, enhance habitat connectivity once again, and maximize natural areas while improving the quality of that habitat and promoting ecosystem services. So that was seen throughout the biodiversity strategy. 
The city of Surrey also had development permit guidelines for both all development types and sensitive ecosystems, which had alignment. So for the all development types, which is for all development, um, it's necessary to provide stormwater management strategies for the development sites, as well as the promotion of using native planting that require less pesticides, as well as less water. So there's supposed to be reduction of water quality, um, I mean, water use on site and the promotion of reusing water as well. So again, promoting the utilization of removal pavers was seen in this, um, in the guidelines for the all development types, um, as well as the reduction of light pollution um, and limiting the potential for bird collisions. So that's also explicitly outlined in the fifth standard for salmon safe as well. So considering urban ecological function and the wildlife occurring within those uh, development areas. And then the sensitive ecosystems development permit guidelines. Um, those once again had the same sort of trend for minimizing habitat fragmentation and promoting habitat connectivity, um, minimizing any impervious areas and reducing light pollution and maintaining natural hydrological cycles and in order to retain biodiversity as well. So it also required um, the incorporation of on-site stormwater management as well as erosion and sediment control best management practices were prescribed in the sensitive ecosystems DPA. So you can see for the city of Surrey, um, across the top, the official community plan, once again, was really comprehensive in combination with the development permit areas um, that I just outlined. The integrated stormwater management plans, uh, which I read through, had a lot of mention, obviously, of stormwater management, but also a heavy focus on biodiversity and the protection of riparian and stream areas and erosion and sediment control measures. So there was alignment with some sort of policy legislation and act um, across all of the different standards for the city of Surrey as well. And finally, for the Corporation of Delta, again, I looked at their ISMPs, bylaws and development permit areas as well and outlined them here. So the zoning bylaw didn't necessarily have very high alignment. In fact, this was low, these are low alignments, but it did encourage permeable surface use and um, required native plantings that are drought tolerant and hardy and uh, required the retention of native vegetation on site as well. They also had the pesticide use control bylaw and this also had a ban on the use of pesticides for cosmetic purposes as well. And then the last was the waterways protection bylaw, again, which was very similar to the other waterways, which is no obstructing or fouling of the waterways on the property. And I wanted to mention the stream protection and enhancement areas um, as well, because this is required for all developments and properties within 30 meters from the top of the bank. And this was unique in terms of it explicitly stating that there needs to be a net benefit to the riparian area. So I was told that if a developer goes in and the riparian area is just grass, that that is obviously not native vegetation necessarily. So if it isn't, then it needs to be restored into its natural state. So there has to be a net benefit to the riparian area during development, as well as limiting any drainage offsite and impacting the area, as well as controlling erosion and sediment during development um, on site. So you can see um, the official community plan in combination with the development permit areas did have quite high alignment all the way for all of the standards and as well as the pesticide use bylaw um, and the ISMPs also had quite high alignment with the last two standards in protecting those sensitive, sensitive ecosystems and promoting stormwater management. So to kind of reiterate all of those trends that I had trying to point out as I was talking, so you kept them in the back of your mind. Um, this is just a general provincial alignment. So as you can see, the salmon safe standards are each of the different graphics across, and this is just very qualitative. So there is low and high alignment. So wherever the graphic is along the chart demonstrates how high the alignment might've been with salmon safe. So, of course, as you can see, the riparian wetland and locally significant vegetation protection and restoration 
the seventh standard had much higher alignment with provincial standards than any of the other standards. Um, and that was primarily in the form of the riparian areas regulation, um, as well as stormwater management and the in-stream habitat protection and restoration. Those standards were definitely um, in alignment, once again, with the RAR, as well as with the Water Sustainability Act and the Environmental Management Act and the required liquid waste management plans under that. And then for the local government, this is just a general overview of all of the governments if I combine them into one. So across the region for municipalities, there was a lot of trends shown for especially standard five. There was lots of alignment with development, um, ensuring that there's a heavy emphasis on habitat connectivity across the site, as well as restoration of those ecosystems. There was also quite high alignment with stormwater management being required on site, which I know is now a requirement. Um, and then also lots of erosion and sediment control bylaws and the banning of pesticide use for any sort of cosmetic use. Um, and then also there was more alignment with the water use management within local governments in comparison to the higher levels of government because this really encouraged the use of water reuse, rainwater harvesting and graywater reuse as well. So I really, I from what I heard through conversation as well, is that I think that the standard for water use management might be a bit lower is there are a few stumbling blocks associated with the requirement of or using non potable water within buildings and gray water reuse. So I know that that might be um, a bit of an obstacle for some municipalities uh, based on the building code. So to finish this all off with um, some of the information that I took from our interviews starting with a bit of an overview. So I had 15 participants from federal, provincial, and local governments, um, as well as some insight from local experts. And then I had 10 to 13 questions that I asked, and these range from stormwater management and green infrastructure to jurisdiction and policy enforcement tools. And overall, the biggest like takeaways was that almost 100%, so 93% agreed or responded rather, that our current development patterns are unsustainable for the long-term health of our watersheds. However, we are turning the corner and definitely are implementing more sustainable strategies. So there definitely is hope. 100% of the participants agreed that um, green infrastructure is one of the most effective tools for managing stormwater. However, it is not the only tool for managing stormwater. So it needs to be implemented in partnership with other sorts of on-site strategies. And 100% of the participants agreed that green infrastructure should be used as a relative development standard going forward. But that is once again, in combination with other strategies as well to ma effectively manage um, stormwater on site and promote biodiversity across the site too. So this was a word cloud that was generated from the interviews that I had talking about the most effective policy tools. So a lot of the responses talked about the zoning and building bylaws being really effective policy tools at the implementation stage. So before development even takes place, um, regulations and really strong guidelines before the development stage were really essential. So drafting in the early stages, um, including this sort of on-site stormwater management biodiversity and all that sorts of ecosystem protection before the development even starts. And then bylaws definitely were effective. However, they were described as retroactive. So you can only really enforce a bylaw when something has gone wrong. So that's a little bit waiting too long. Um, however, it was also told that the implementation of bylaws has changed certain developer behavior, which was interesting um, to note as well. As well as the most effective policy tools come in a combination of tools. So it has to be a bunch of different regulations and guidelines and standards. And then the provincial um, block there that's really large was talking about having that top down authority control as well as a combination with the bottom up. So I think that is really beautifully um, outlined by Melina from the city of Vancouver, who I spoke with. Um, and she talked about the need for training new generations to make green infrastructure the standard of practice. So there was, she really gave a really wonderful um, comparison 
uh, that the same hesitations were there with energy efficiency when it was being put first into, into design. So what was once a major stumbling block for a lot of developers has now become more of a norm for development. So a lot of buildings meet that energy efficiency. Um, and it's just considered part of the development process now. So hopefully we can get green infrastructure to eventually get to that stage. Um, we just need that top-down leadership to enforce as well as the bottom-up balance at the same time. As for the trends in the jurisdictional gaps, this one was quite interesting. So as you can see, the gaps in the monitoring as well as confusion with the projects, provincial jurisdiction for streams and who's involved in what part of the process. There is quite a bit of confusion about riparian areas and in-stream works as well as the monitoring. Um, there was limited staff and resources, which created a lot of those jurisdictional gaps, it seemed. There was a lacking of coordination, um, as well as repetitive requirements. So that was something that was expressed quite a bit, was that there's the same requirements at different levels of government. Um, so it doesn't seem like there's that communication between the levels of government. Um, and then there's also confusion over what level of government and what minister needs to be involved in the different sorts of projects that are taking place within the municipality. So the other thing that really came through in one of my interviews with the province was that the efforts, if they were being put, if they had to pick between going towards liquid waste management or stormwater management, due to the limited resources at this time, a lot of the effort has been directed into liquid waste management um, in the form of municipal discharge primarily. So a lot of focus and effort has been directed to that, which has not put enough emphasis on stormwater management. So I know that they definitely hope to and have plans to implement that more uh, strongly at a provincial level, but as of right now, there seems to be that a bit of a gap within the implementation of stormwater management. So I think this is really perfectly um, emphasized from Craig Orr, who I think is also here today. Um, he was one of the outside external experts that I spoke with, and he talked about the water sustainability referrals and how they're causing quite a lot of pressure on First Nations, and there isn't necessarily the capacity to cover all of these referrals. So this was a really great process in theory coming up, but there may not be that connection and capacity within the First Nations to handle that. And a lot of the applications are also missing components that are really essential and important to the First Nations. So it just emphasizes once again, that lacking communication and coordination element between um, the different levels of government. And then another wonderful quote by Kim Stevens um, from the Water Sustainability Action Plan. Uh, he was speaking about at the end of the 2008 financial crisis, um, there was a lack of provincial presence within the different tables um, meeting about stormwater management. They didn't necessarily travel to these meetings or actively participate as they did before and prior to 2008. And this meant that there is no longer necessarily a central authority to provide the guidance and clarity regarding the expectations and consequences. Um, so this really, once again, emphasizes the confusion over what happens with non-compliance, as well as what is actually required and when is it required for different municipalities. So in summary, from the interview process, um, our development patterns are unsustainable, but there definitely is hope and promise. And there are business cases that are demonstrating that as Sam and Safe has certifications within the region that are demonstrating that these sorts of practices are possible. Um, green infrastructure can be a useful tool for managing rainwater runoff. However, it needs to be in combination, once again, with other tools and eco-certifications were expressed that they can provide that education element necessary for the effective implementation of green infrastructure in the region, um, providing education to developers as well as to the general public as well. So the last two takeaways really were, again, that green infrastructure should be used as a standard for development, but there needs to be an understanding of the hydrology of the actual watershed. So you can't necessarily implement a rain garden in one part of the city and expect that it's going to provide the exact same benefits in a different part of the city. So it really depends on the hydrology of the site that you're working within and the overall watershed. So there has to be that watershed, regional and neighborhood and local scale, as well as a site scale taken into account with these development processes. 
in some final concluding thoughts about the entirety of this project. So with the indigenous governments looking at the land use plans, action plans and community values, although it was a very brief um, and superficial overview as I didn't get to dive too deep into it, I think it already provided quite a bit of alignment um, in suggesting that future research into this could provide more alignment. Um, and I know that there's lots of efforts being put into more sustainable development both on and off reserve and protecting the interconnectedness that exists between their people, the land and the water as well. Um, at the federal level, we had the Fisheries Act and the Land Development Guidelines, which were very commonly cited. Those were created in 1992, so they're older than I am actually. So it, it would be interesting to know if those are going to be um, improved or updated at some point um, and why they're necessarily being used. Uh, at a provincial level, there was lots of alignment with the riparian and stream protection efforts. So it was mostly in the form of the objectives of what Salmon Safe is aiming for. Um, and the highest alignment was with standards for riparian and stream protection. However, there was limited involvement in stormwater management. And there, however, was high alignment with the guidance documents that were provided by the province. So not necessarily in the acts or legislation to be enforced, but there were quite a bit of guidance documents provided for municipalities to utilize for more effective on-site stormwater management and sustainable development in general. And then at our local level, there was lots of alignment with the ISMPs. There was heavy emphasis once again on habitat restoration, protection, and um, protecting and promoting those wildlife corridors throughout the region. Um, which it kind of comes hand in hand with green infrastructure, especially with stormwater management. Those sorts of systems are nicely integrated together, which is with what is within Salmon Safe, of course. Um, and then there's also lots of alignment with the design guidelines for the uh, development permit areas as well. And lastly, for the official community plans had a very extensive alignment with the overall policies. So the goals of and direction of future development within the municipality. Um, I didn't include the neighborhood concept plans here today because that would have taken a very long time to go to a neighborhood scale to uh, assess the alignment. However, a lot of, especially the newer neighborhood concept plans and local area plans, those had quite a bit of alignment in terms of the requirements specifically for that neighborhood scale, which is similar to the ISMPs at, um, at, at an urban watershed scale as well. So that is all I have today. <laughs> all I have that took quite a long time to get through, but I hope that you enjoyed and thank you for taking the time to listen. I really uh, appreciate it. And if anyone has any questions and comments. I'm sure there's quite a bit. I can see them coming through. So please, this is now the time to ask them. Thanks so much, Andrea. I wonder if we can go. Oh, there we go. Go back to this view. So this is the time that I would encourage everyone to open up that Q&A box that you can find at the, the bottom of your screen in the toolbar and enter any questions. Um, comments are also OK there so that we can address them. And uh, I'm just going to read the ones that are currently in the Q&A box um, in order. And then I also see that uh, someone's entered something in the chat as well. So Pamela Zevit from the city of Surrey, hi Pamela, um, has written, uh, for your information, Surrey is presently developing biodiversity design guidelines, which have implicit linkages to the urban and rural salmon safe standards and we will be undertaking a natural asset inventory initiative for one of our major watersheds. So it's great to know, Pamela, thank you for sharing that. Um, and she's also mentioned for, for the Species at Risk Act, wouldn't individual recovery strategies and management plans have close alignment with salmon safe approaches, including those for non-fish aquatic habitat codependent species? So I'll, I'll maybe pass that one to you, Andrea, for, for any comments, since I know you've uh, reviewed Sarah. Yeah, so I would say that's very likely. I didn't necessarily have the time to dive into very like, specific recovery strategies, um, but that's definitely something I'll consider to add to the research to complement it a little bit, because I know that it is relevant um, for not just aquatic species, as you pointed out. So thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Great. 
And uh, we've got uh, a, a question here from Dan Kent, uh, who's our colleague over at the Sam and Safe US office in Portland. Um, thanks, Andrea, for this excellent comparison. Based on your analysis and your strong understanding of Sam and Safe requirements, if you could make a single addition to Sam and Safe standards, what would it be? In other words, what would you say is the biggest thing missing in Sam and Safe standards? That is a really great question. And I might have to take a minute to think about it and come back to the answer to digest a little bit, if that's okay. No worries, you can come back to that. Um, and I've got another note here from Pamela from City of Surrey. For local governments with a high percentage of urban, suburban, and agriculture slash agricultural land reserve lands, when the riparian area regulation has limited application, is there a blended approach we could consider for the two land use type salmon safe standards? Uh, is that in reference to a blended approach between the urban and ALR? I guess. Yes, I okay. think so. Yeah, I'm not familiar necessarily with the, because uh, I know that Salmon Safe has an agricultural uh, certification as well, but that mm -hmm. definitely is something that I had noticed, and maybe this is the answer actually to the other question, <laughs> was um, a lot of the municipalities are referencing residential development, and I'm not sure as to what scale. Um, I don't know now how if anyone has a salmon safe home or if that has been certified in the past. Um, but there's lots of emphasis within municipalities for that residential level development because there are definitely huge developments that take place, but a lot of the city is covered in people's driveways and their homes and backyards. So having it at even that smaller residential scale, I think could be really effective and trying to implement it more there could be really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Andrea. And just a note that we, we don't do certifications for single family homes at this time. It's mostly for uh, commercial development, multi-story residential um, developments. But this is a good question in terms of that more suburban, maybe ALR land context where we can consider what would that look like if it was at the single home, single family home level. Great, and just some, some comments in the comment box or the chat box. Um, we've got a note here from, from Harvey Takar from City of Delta. Great work, Andrea. Feel free to reach out to us at City of Delta if we can help in any other way. Um, we've got Christine, Christina Toss um, from Fraser Basin Council. That was an astounding presentation. Thank you for sharing all this work, very enlightening. And, and a number of other uh, uh, complimentary comments about your presentation. So I don't see any other questions in, in oh, I do have another chat another set of comments in the Q&A. Um, Kurt Frey from City of Port Moody. Thanks, Andrea. What input have you received regarding staff capacity to monitor slash enforce these policies at the municipal level? That is a really great question. So um, I think that was something that was definitely really interesting that came through, especially in the interview process, because a lot of these bylaws and um, even plans in general have very ambitious targets and goals um, and seeing the implementation on the ground may be a totally different thing. So I know that by law enforcement, um, there was a lot of discussion about the lack of education in terms of what the bylaw means in the communication with the developers as well. So what the bylaw means for developers, if they understand it better, then complying with it will be easier, um, as well as the bylaw enforcers. So understanding what the actual what the bylaw looks like and what those things that they should be looking for are um, was definitely a missing link, it seemed. And the last thing I would add to that, um, in terms of monitoring and enforcing these policies in general, uh, I talked about the gaps in terms of the coordination and for some government departments, there seemed to be a bit of overlap in terms of the planning department and who handles that in the planning department versus the environmental protection department or the engineering department and having not necessarily that there was much of a siloed approach, but there was those different responsibilities within what's required for SAM and SACE, which takes that more holistic approach. So I know that those requirements are kind of different scattered across the different um, departments. So I think that definitely could uh, impact the monitoring and enforcing of these different policies. 
Thanks. We have another um, comment here from Alan Sakai, who is from the Steveston Community Association and Salmon Festival Chair. Excellent presentation. I learned a lot. I'm interested raising awareness of such issues in the community in which I live. Oh, that's great. And um, coming from, from the Richmond uh, Steveston area. So thank you so much, Alan. I did want to circle back to Dan's question, um, which I know you wanted a minute to sort of let it sit. Uh, and uh, just to repeat the question, um, if you could uh, make a single addition to salmon safe standards, what would it be? In other words, what would you say is the biggest thing missing in the salmon safe standards? Definitely. I don't necessarily think it's missing within the salmon safe standards, but I think the, as I kind of demonstrated throughout the presentation, the alignment with the second standard, water use conservation and management sort of thing, and that approach for development um, was not necessarily, uh, didn't necessarily come through in a lot of the different bylaws and design requirements. So I think either in altering of that or trying to align it better with what is required, um, could be necessary. And I just saw someone else who put in a wonderful answer and I'll steal that saying climate change also having that, which I know is also going to be incorporated, it seems. So yeah, having a resilient approach to this because a lot of these sorts of requirements, um, it needs to take into account, like obviously how climate is gonna be changing our environment um, to make more resilient development in communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And and I just saw the, there in the chat, um, Patrick Lilly, who's actually, he's with Kerwood, Lytle, uh, but is also one of our Salmon Safe BC assessors, um, suggested climate change as a potential, potential missing component in the standards. And just wanted to reiterate, as in my introduction, that's um, a current revision that's being undertaken on the standards currently. And uh, my hope is that we'll be able to, again, release that to the world uh, in the coming months. So I, it's great that there's some synergy with people's comments and what's happening right now. So we don't have any additional questions in the Q&A box, but I did want to uh, pass it to Adil, who may have um, some questions that he might want to pose to Andrea. Thanks, Teresa. And I would, uh, I think, also reflect the sentiment that many others had, that it, it's a uh, Wonderful presentation, uh, you know, summarizing uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, so thank, thank you, Andrea, for doing that. Uh, you know, when we started this uh, project, the idea was to uh, look at the, um, the areas where uh, the salmon safe standards can actually uh, complement or even supplement the, the existing uh, uh, policies. And without delving too much into the weeds, it, you know, at, at a macro scale, um, do you think, for example, if you look at the provincial policies, are there areas where there are uh, better and maybe better elucidated standards and salmon safe program that can be lifted into the provincial policies? So that's one part of the question. And then I'll come back to the other question. Can you go the other way as well? Definitely. Um, I would say the approach of the Water Sustainability Act, taking that really like holistic watershed management le level and um, the watershed sustainability plans, that concept, I don't know necessarily how could it be effectively integrated into salmon safe, but having the coordination because I think it's really, again, important that this can happen at a site level, but again, it's all draining into the same basin and having that more watershed level approach and the connections between those different developments could be uh, something to integrate, I think, uh, or something, something to consider. And then I would say, um, so I think that was strong at, within the Water Sustainability Act. I don't know how it's been implemented necessarily yet. Um, and then I would say, the other way uh, for the salmon safe standards for, is it provincial level that you were asking about or? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, that's probably the most relevant uh, level other than, as you said, if you get into the details of the municipal uh, regulations and bylaws. Definitely. Well, it's stormwater management. I think that is a huge missing element at the provincial level. Um, 
And I know that there's like been efforts and discussion about it, but having like a dedicated department that focuses directly on that rather than having a bunch of people from different departments considering it um, to put the specific emphasis on it would definitely, I think, help aid a lot of these um, problems we're seeing in urban watersheds. Great, thanks. So we do have uh, a couple of more questions uh, that have appeared in the meanwhile. So Michael Weed from Vancouver is asking, what is the biggest challenge for a municipality to adopt and incorporate the salmon safe standards? Where, where are the challenges? Why isn't there a larger uptake? I don't know if Teresa has a answer to this from actual experience, but before she gets into it, I'll kind of say um, that I know from conversation, there was quite a bit of hesitation in the sense of the, uh, the price for a lot of the municipalities um, enforcing that added cost may be a limiting factor. Um, so I had heard that through discussion, but I, I'm not sure. I'm interested if, Teresa, you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think um, a lot of maybe the gaps is, is just getting the word out there about the Salmon Safe program. Um, I think that we, we had huge efforts in terms of, of starting a webinar series and trying to extend invitations and communications to local governments, uh, especially in the Metro Vancouver area, um, just to, to get people in the know about this program and what it's doing. And we've certainly seen in this year in 2020, a huge uptick in terms of people who are aware about the program, um, recommendations going from municipalities to developers uh, when they submit their development permit application to consider salmon safe. We're seeing more of that now in this year and it's, and it's just continuing to climb. So I think um, our first hurdle was just getting the word out, um, but we are seeing uh, further adoption and we're getting inquiries in terms of how salmon safe standards can actually be applied at a municipal level for their public infrastructure, which I find very interesting. And we have two examples of that. The city of Vancouver has approached us um, and we're now starting a pilot project uh, to look at how these standards can be applied for their public works. Um, but also we've had other municipalities come forward to explore this a little bit um, and, and exploring what it means to be a salmon safe city. Um, which is really interesting. Uh, for those that have been following Salmon Safe, you'll know that there are, uh, th that city of Portland is, is a Salmon Safe city. Um, and the, the mayor of Portland, the former mayor of Portland at the time actually issued a challenge to Washington State and Vancouver uh, mayors to explore what it would be like to be a Salmon Safe city uh, since they were the first and that we should follow suit. So I found that kind of interesting. And, and so we, when we have conversations with municipalities, there's, there's just more knowledge and, and more interest in terms of how this can be explored further. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Andrea. Um, I think that I was great. That we have another question um, from Kurt Frey from City of Port Moody. And he mentions, you, you mentioned the stumbling block. Have we received any input from the private sector whom are asked to integrate these policies? I have not. And that's actually something I realized in hindsight probably would have been a very interesting addition to this to understand um, not just like experts on stormwater management or riparian areas per se, but having someone firsthand talk about the development process. Because as I've already said multiple times, what happens on paper and what happens in actual practice are two different things. So getting the insight from like the planning departments and engineering departments was very eye-opening in comparison to maybe what the policies actually stated. Um, and a lot of the times it was stronger within the actual department. So it may not say that it's required or the language being shall or must, but it is shall or must whether or not they get their permit approved. Um, so to see the other side of that, I think would be really interesting. So I really appreciate that feedback and we'll definitely take it into consideration. Mm -hmm. And definitely something that we could flag as a potential future project for Salmon Safe to explore a little bit more. Uh, we have a, a question here from Francis Ramsey at City of North Van. And she says, uh, or he says, what are the top policies across municipalities that our municipalities can look at to align more with salmon safe requirements. Sorry, let me repeat that question because was I think there was a typo. What are the top policies across municipalities that other municipalities can look at 
to align more with sound and safe requirements. Thank you, Francis. And I think that is a really great question. I'm just kind of going through the matrix that I have set up. And I would say that um, for a lot, this is a, not necessarily the most helpful answer, but um, I think a lot of the development permit area requirements, which are incorporated into the official community plans provide like a lot of alignment um, across. And more specifically, uh, I would point to the City of Surrey's Stormage Drainage Regulation and Charges by Law. That one had quite a lot of alignment as well. Um, and yeah, and I would also point to the District of North Vancouver's uh, development permit areas as well. I think those, as well as their development, development servicing bylaw, I think that was a, a very holistic and comprehensive bylaw tried to target a bunch of different things rather than just riparian or um, riparian area protection, but incorporate all the different aspects as well. I'm sure there's a longer list. So once I finish my report, so I'll put it in there so that uh, people can have a actual copy and I'll have more thought to put into it at that point. Great, thanks. Um, and I also just mentioning the report, there was a request in the chat um, to access the report. And I think many folks on this uh, on the line here would probably like to access that. So is that something that could be made public, Andrea? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I have nothing to hide. So as long as it's okay with the Fraser Basin Council, I'm, I'd love to share it. It won't necessarily be polished off until the new year. So I will need time to make sure that it's written in a digestible format. Um, but yeah, I would love to share it if people are interested to read it, definitely. Sounds good. So we have a, a question here from Hagen Han Nordorf. Um, my apologies if I butchered your name. Um, have you received interest from the development community in the lower mainland with regards to salmon safe standards? Have you reached out to them? If so, what has been their response? So maybe this is one that I could I could um, speak to uh, since you're seeing I'm seeing you nod Andrea. So has there been interest in the development community in the Lower Mainland um, with respect to Salmon Safe program and certification in general? I would say absolutely. Um, we've had a number of of developers, design firms, engineering firms attend our webinars or our online events and our in-person events in years past, um, and we're seeing again much like we're getting a growth in municipal engagement, we're getting a growth in terms of interest from, from the development community. Um, just to give you a sense of scope, um, so uh, I didn't mention this in my presentation, but we currently have three certified sites. Um, we have six sites that are in progress, which is a huge growth from last year. Um, and we have six more leads uh, on, on different sites in the lower mainland. So that just gives you a sense of the, the scale of growth because we, we had more smaller numbers in years past. And a lot of that is, is really related to the outreach, the level of outreach that we've been able to do um, with both the development community and, uh, and municipalities. Um, yeah, and in terms of their response, uh, they're, they're curious. Um, they attend a lot of our introductory sessions uh, talking about the standards and the certification program. Um, they're curious about it uh, and many of them see the value of it. So that's where we're seeing that, that growth and interest um, to apply it to different sites. Um, I think one of the most interesting comments I've received from developers is that the standards and the process and level of support that the Salmon Safe staff gives during the process really help them um, you know, be innovative to implement different um, innovations related to green, whether it's green infrastructure or biodiversity values in an urban context. Like just having a bit of guidance and bringing in our independent science team to like collaborate and have those generative conversations, they, they find a lot of value in that. Um, whereas in many cases they're having to seek out, you know, consultants of their own that may or may not have the expertise that our independent science team has. And I've just, uh, in the processes we've been a part of and facilitated, um, we've gotten a lot of really good responses in terms of, of what that process has yielded. And we can see it in the way that the site is designed and then implemented um, to receive certification. So I hope that answers your, your question. Um, 
And I wonder, I, I don't know if anybody else had any comments on my team um, to weigh in on that piece. Okay. Um, I'm just scanning the Q&A box and I don't think I see any um, more questions. So, so there's one more that came in that says, can you speak a bit to the long-term maintenance of certification? This seems to come up with municipalities and clients at a point of hesitation to pursue certification. But this is, I think, certainly pointed at you, Teresa. Yeah, so th thanks for the question. I believe that's Jenna. Um, hello, Jenna. So uh, in terms of the maintenance, so just to give you a sense of what the certification cycle is when you receive certification for, the, for urban development, it's a, a five-year certification cycle. Uh, and upon issuance of the five-year certification, um, the on-site assessment report that we issue will have a number of different um, conditions if, if needed and recommendations related to continuous improvement for the site. And what we do during the five-year certification cycle is we do an annual check-in with the landowner or the, the owner of the building um, to, to see what the progress is on some of those conditions, which are usually time-bound, um, and, and also those recommendations, which are non-binding um, for continuous improvement. So there's that support and that check-in on how things are going, has anything changed? Um, past the five-year certification cycle, in the last year is usually when our team will reach out um, for recertification. And in many cases, um, we do get, like for the three certified sites that we have, there is an interest in recertification and being able to keep that logo on their premises and be able to, you know, brag that they are indeed CMSA certified. So we would go and undertake um, a more streamlined recertification process to ensure that the site is still in compliance with the standards. And then we would again issue another five-year uh, certification for the site. Um, so in terms of long-term maintenance, I mean, that's essentially how the, the cycles work. Um, and I mean, I think in terms of what some challenges might be, I mean, these are the things that we would come up and we would help address with you know, proper support when we do that annual review. So if there are any challenges with um, you know, different implementation aspects of the standards, I mean, these are the things that we would typically have conversations with in that annual check-in. And you know, having the expertise that we have in terms of our assessment team, you know, this is where we can come up with more innovative solutions and it alerts us if um, there are some challenges with implementing the standards uh, for, for that five-year lifetime of the certification. And, and if those are flagged, then we help to fund solutions um, at the site level and site context. So I, I hope that answers some of the, the questions. I, I think that's one of the unique things that, that Simon State brings is just that support, that level of support and that level of relationship um, to the folks that are under the certification program. I'd also add to that too, because I think that's a really wonderful part of Salmon Safe because something else that really came through in a lot of the interview processes, um, process rather, uh, was the fact that these systems can be implemented and put uh, on the site, but then who's responsible for maintaining them afterwards? If that's uh, the local government's responsibility, is it the developer to maintain those? Or is it the homeowner? Um, those sorts of, it's not clear necessarily as to what is actually required. And some of the bylaws do make that explicit. Um, however, I don't know if it's necessarily carried through. So having the check-ins with Sam and Safe, I think is like another reminder that those sorts of things would be carried through and that it's not just put in and then becomes useless in five years because the system gets clogged or whatever it may be, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so interesting um, in terms of uh, like the who does what piece. Uh, we've had a number of conversations, especially with multi-unit residential, um, when there is a, a changeover from the developer to the strata, um, you know, we would help develop, you know, that handover package to the strata so that they have all of those policies in place in terms of, you know, landscaping guidelines and the, if there's pesticide reduction or elimination, um, depending on, on the site context. 
Um, those kinds of things are, are this level of support that, that Simon Safe can weigh in on. And, and in, an interesting issue when you have you know, multi-unit residential, um, that there is a Passover from um, the, the developer to the Strata Council and how is the Strata Council going to be guided in terms of operations and maintenance of, of the site. And so those are things we can certainly help with and, and give guidance documents for. So I know you've been tracking the Q&A box there, Adil, um, and I'm just also looking at the timeline. We are at 1151, so maybe if we, if anyone has one or two more questions, and then we can um, do our, our closing uh, piece to this session. I was going to add, I just saw it in the, um, Kurt just brought it up about the local stream keepers. And I think it's also, I didn't mention it during the presentation, I realized, but that was also something that really came through a lot of the time was how integral stream keepers and local volunteers have been to this process overall, uh, putting like the pressure on local governments to adopt new bylaws and protect stream side areas and riparian areas or what have you. So I think that local volunteer groups and stream keepers have been the ultimate champions when it comes to especially stormwater management. So they do not go unnoticed, definitely. And I think that they've played such a huge role. So they deserve the shout out that they need. <laughs> yeah, no, great point. And, and you'll see in the chat that, uh, well, it, to the panelists, Kurt has said, on some files, it's expected for local stream keeper groups to take over habitat maintenance and monitoring. Um, and I did want to give a, a shout out because I do know that uh, Glenn Parker is on the on the line um, from the North Shore Stream Keepers. Um, and I think I saw Sean Hollingsworth from the Salmonid Society who are all part of that Stream Keeper network. Um, please feel free to weigh in on the chat box. Um, but yes, that's a good point, Kurt, in terms of that expectation for uh, the Passover to Stream Keeper groups. Um, and I also see uh, Jane McCarthy in the chat here. The maintenance element is an issue with rain gardens. That support and handover would be effective for long-term success and widespread public adoption. And I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on this point, uh, Andrea, but I, I have a couple of, of points related to that, but I'll open it for you. No, I think you probably have a, a better answer for this, but I, I definitely agree having that, the clarity as to what happens after um, would be very, very helpful in providing that process and getting over that hesitation of the unknown sort of thing as to what comes next. Mm -hmm, definitely, and I would echo that. And thanks so much for the comment, Jane. It is a real challenge as we continue to increase and adopt green infrastructure approaches to stormwater management um, upon other factors. And I, I think this has come up for us as well as what is the what is the long term maintenance plan of that infrastructure and, and who is the one to monitor that and who's the one to upkeep it. Um, I think when it comes to buildings like multi unit residential or commercial, you know, the developer is fact factoring that in, in terms of who that um, building ownership, is, what that building ownership is going to look like past their, um, their ownership of it. Um, so in that context, for sure. But if it's a rain garden set up, let's say uh, on a stream next to a, a parking lot, um, you know, then it becomes public infrastructure, I would assume. And then there's questions about like, you know, who's responsible for monitoring that and maintaining that. And I know that um, Jane, I believe you are involved in the North Shore Rain Garden Project. And I know that there's a rain garden there at McKay Creek and that the, the rain garden project is monitoring that rain garden. So that's very interesting um, case that we might look at in terms of, you know, what are your findings, not only in terms of the efficacy, of the, the water quality and of the infrastructure itself to do that job. But then also, you know, what's the maintenance plan? Is that a challenge? And, uh, you know, what, what, are, what are some answers or recommendations that that group has? Um, so thank you for the comment. Certainly timely when we're talking about green infrastructure. So in light of time, and um, I just wanted to check in with the deal if you, if you saw, oh, I see one, one last comment here from, from Jennifer from City of New West. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Andrea. I really enjoyed it in the Q&A afterwards. Um, and Teresa's comments related to Salmon Safe as well. Thank you all. And thank you, Jennifer, and all of our, our participants. Um, and I'd like to recommend to, to make sure we end on time. 
uh, and Adil and Andrea, if you're okay with it, just uh, moving towards our closing items. Okay, great. I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, and I do encourage you if you're on the line still to please stay for another minute or two because I do have a very exciting announcement. Um, so for those of you that have been following Salmon Safe and Salmon Safe BC, um, you'll know that uh, we've had a challenge in terms of not having a website. Um, and I just wanted to make the exciting announcement that we have now a new and improved website, which is now live, and you can access it uh, at salmonsafe.ca. And I wanted to point out a, a number of key features that are, are now on the website, which is gonna be hugely helpful for those of you that want more information about the Salmon Safe program. So firstly, there's an interactive map. Who doesn't love maps? Um, and the interactive map um, tracks our current urban certified sites, as well as our agriculture certified sites. And so um, please click on the salmon where the site is, and you can uh, access a, a number of different pieces of information about that site. Um, the second useful piece uh, that might interest you is it does provide an overview of the certification process. So for those of you that haven't had any um, contact with Salmon Safe before, you might be curious about what certification means. Um, and so the, the website uh, does allow for you to track what the certification process is, if you want that information, as well as you can access the urban standards uh, on our website. We also have a, a blog feature, which we will be launching soon, as well as a newsletter feature. And I do encourage you all to sign up for our newsletter um, to keep in touch with us and also to um, get the latest on Salmon Safe news and events. And of course, uh, also on the website is our contact information, but I did want to quickly put it here. If you need to get in touch with the Salmon Safe BC team, uh, please do reach out and contact myself. Uh, and we also have Christine Doiran, our program coordinator, uh, who's available to take any um, inquiries as well. And we would be remiss to not all wish you on behalf of Salmon Safe BC, Fraser Basin Council and Pacific Water Research Center, um, the best wishes for a happy and healthy holiday season. Um, and we, we love this little uh, image, uh, which, which are salmon. Uh, hopefully we can give them reasons to celebrate uh, the holidays by making sure that we uh, protect and improve our, our watershed health um, and their habitats um, so that they can also enjoy a, a happy and healthy holiday season. So with that, I'll pass it back to Adil um, for some closing comments. Thank you very much, Teresa. And, and thank you for moderating the conversation so flawlessly, thank you, it, it worked out really well. And uh, thank you to the participants for flagging some excellent questions. We, we are actually um, uh, taking good note of both your comments and, and the questions. Um, I do also want to recognize uh, Kelsey Taylor, who's uh, with us. And, and I understand this is her last working day at Fraser Basin Council, but she has been truly a partner in crime with us in, in uh, design of this study and implementing and providing support and backstopping. So thank you very much, Kelsey. And uh, finally, thank you, Andrea. I, I think you've not only done a marvelous uh, research project, but your presentation was outstanding. So uh, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I do wanna leave with a, with a couple of thoughts uh, with the Pacific Water Research Center. We are uh, continuing to engage with uh, a number of partners, civil society organizations, research outfits. Uh, one of our main area of interest is on use of green infrastructure on achieving and improving water management and water quality objectives. And we are engaged with a number of municipalities and uh, First Nations uh, governments. Uh, so please do uh, circle back to me if you're interested. We, we run a workshop series. Now it's a virtual workshop series every two months and, and we are exploring uh, different issues on the operational sides and, and uh, looking at the stumbling blocks and the policy frameworks. So um, lots of interesting stuff to come. This is a, uh, a starting point in a way of uh, exploring these uh, policy uh, challenges, opportunities in, in a very structured way. So uh, we appreciate and, and thank Andrea for leading us by the finger into this, uh, this pathway. So thank you very much all. Uh, have very happy holidays and 
look forward to uh, look forward to, uh, looking forward to seeing you in a similar uh, event in the near future. So thank you very much and goodbye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.